Thank you very much, and uh, thanks very much to the organizers for uh, inviting me to be a part of the conference. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, uh, come here and share with you a little bit of the international survey research that we do at the Pew Research Center. Um, in our international work, we look at a lot of different topics, but the one that I'm going to talk with you about today is probably the one that's gotten the most attention for us <laughs> over the years, uh, how the world sees the United States. And I think in part that's because um, it's been a really interesting story over the last decade and a half, right? Lots of ups and downs, twists and turns, and uh, the debate over torture has been an important part of that story. So what I thought I'd do today is show uh, you some of the, the findings we have in terms of big picture, how the world sees the United States, and talk about how torture uh, plays into that picture. So let me start off by sharing with you some data on what's really our baseline measure of how the world sees the U.S. Uh, very simple question, do you have a favorable or unfavorable opinion of the United States? And if you want to look over at the right side of this slide, the regional medians gives you a sense of how attitudes towards the U.S. on this question break down regionally. So uh, as you can see, across uh, the African nations that we surveyed in a major uh, 40 country survey last year, a median of 79% had a favorable view of the U.S. And that's pretty consistent with what we've seen. Africa was really the one part of the world where you didn't see this rise in anti-Americanism uh, during the Bush era that you saw in many other parts of the world. Um, mostly positive in Asia, the EU, Latin America, um, you know, but it varies within all of these regions to some extent, but overall, mostly favorable overall attitudes towards the U.S. in these regions in this 2015 survey. The Middle East remains the global exception. Um, of course, President Obama came into office very much wanting to turn around America's image in the Middle East. Um, he had a famous speech in Cairo in June 2009 to try to do that, but uh, from what we've seen thus far, there hasn't been that kind of Obama effect in the Middle East or some other predominantly Muslim nations that we've seen around much of the world. Um, so that remains the global outlier. Now, one part of the world where we did see a major change in uh, attitudes towards the U.S. was in Europe uh, once President Obama was elected. So you can see that here in this slide. This is the percentage of people in four Western European countries that we've surveyed over the years who say that uh, they had confidence in George Bush when he was president, and then confidence in President Obama once he was elected. So as you can see, President Bush's rating started off not so great, and then got worse over time. Uh, Iraq War, uh, Abu Ghraib, Guantanamo were certainly big parts of that story. Uh, and then President Obama's elected, comes into office in 2009, you don't have to be a pollster, I think, to know that's a statistically significant change. Uh, you know, very, very positive ratings uh, for President Obama after he's elected. They may have come down a bit in Europe, but they're still, on the whole, very positive. Uh, he's popular there. And that's helped America's image in Europe. Um, and we see a similar pattern in other parts of the world, although not as dramatic as what you see here in Western Europe. Now, um, as I said, the Middle East is an exception. Uh, as well as some other predominantly Muslim countries around the world, uh, in addition to those in the Middle East. So, you know, you look at the same measures here. Uh, George Bush, very unpopular, very low ratings for him in these nations when he's president, down in the single digits in most of these countries. Um, president Obama gets somewhat higher ratings, but they're still pretty low. And you haven't seen that sea change in perceptions of the United States in these countries following President Obama's election. They've seen in some other parts of the world, uh, for example, in Europe. Now, one of the things we like to look at in our surveys is different elements of American power, and how people around the world view different elements of American power, including American hard power or military power. So one question we've asked over time um, is, do you think the United States could be a military threat to your country someday? And as you can see, in these predominantly Muslim nations, we've gotten pretty high numbers of people saying, yes, 
I think the United States could be a military threat to my country someday. Um, I went with uh, my uh, former boss and mentor, Andy Kohut, when he testified on Capitol Hill a few years ago to share some of this data. And of all the questions that uh, he presented, this is the one that grabbed uh, the members of Congress' attention the most. They, they just couldn't believe that these uh, many people in these countries saw the U.S. as a potential military threat. You know, Turkey's been a long-time ally of the United States. Um, Kuwait was in the data set that year, and the congressmen were saying, we liberated Kuwait. How could this be? But I think this question taps into the fact that people in many parts of the world do see the United States um, in, in a way that um, makes them concerned about our overwhelming military power. That's something that, particularly in Muslim nations, causes a lot of public anxiety. Uh, drone strikes is another example of American hard power that creates uh, a lot of opposition in many parts of the world. Uh, this is a question we asked in 40 countries uh, last in 2014. And as you can see, looking across the regional breakdown, a lot of opposition to it around the world. Uh, there were only three countries among these 40 where you had half or more saying that they uh, approved of U.S. drone strikes. Kenya was one. You can see the other two here. The U.S. and Israel is actually more support for the drone strikes in Israel than there is in the United States. But by and large, a lot of opposition to uh, U.S. drone strikes in, in, in most, the vast majority of the countries that we survey. Now, that doesn't mean that people always oppose the, the use of hard power by the U.S., however. Um, we've asked over the last few years about U.S. efforts to fight ISIS in Iraq and Syria. And when we've done that, we see there's a lot of support, some exceptions, but by and large, people support U.S. efforts to fight ISIS. Um, and it's particularly strong in the Middle East and Europe, which I think is interesting because those are parts of the world where um, we saw a lot of opposition to the war in Iraq a decade or so ago, but now there's a lot of concern about ISIS in these countries and a lot of support for the U.S. efforts thus far, at least, to fight ISIS. Now, those don't involve ground troops. Things could change if ground troops were involved, potentially. But in terms of the air power that's being used, there's support for it. So again, highlights the fact that there's not always opposition to the use of hard power by the United States. Um, another kind of example of American power and American reach is the Snowden revelations, the NSA scandal. So again, in 2014, in a 40 country global survey, uh, we asked people what they thought about uh, American eavesdropping, American listening in on uh, communications of various sorts around the world. So these are median percentages across those four countries. Um, and as you can see, uh, you know, huge majorities tend to say they find American monitoring of citizens uh, in their country uh, unacceptable, listening in on the communications of leaders in their country unacceptable. People also don't like the idea of, of uh, eavesdropping on American citizens. They don't think the U.S. government should be doing that. The only way that uh, they support American eavesdropping is if you say it's all on suspected terrorists. So that's the only condition under which people tend to say, yes, um, I support uh, American electronic surveillance. But uh, this um, generated a lot of global opposition, as you know. And I think it hurt American soft power uh, in some important ways. Now let's look at some uh, questions specifically about torture. Um, we did a big global survey again, 40 countries, in 2015, early in that year. So it was just a couple of months after the December 2014 Senate torture report, which of course got a lot of attention around the world. And we wanted to uh, take the temperature of, of people around the world and see what their reactions to it were. Um, and what we find is that by and large, people tended to say that they did not think the use of torture by the US in the post 9-11 era was justified. So globally, a median of 50% said not justified, 35% said justified. And uh, as you can see, there's some exceptions, but by and large, across regions, people tended to oppose the U.S. use of torture. Uh, Africa was an outlier. Again, as you saw earlier, we tend to get a lot of positive responses about the U.S. in Africa. 
Uh, and the U.S. was an outlier. Um, you know, the U.S., uh, about 6 and 10, said they thought this post-9-11 post use of torture by the United States uh, was justifiable. So um, global opposition, but the U.S. and a few other places um, were exceptions to that. Now, what we see in a number of countries is that there was um, an ideological gap on this question, especially in Europe. Now, if you, if you look uh, across these European countries, with the exception of Poland, even among those on the political right, uh, they were still um, you know, less than half saying that they thought that uh, the use of torture by the United States was justifiable. But those on the political right were certainly much more likely than those on the left to say that they found uh, the use of torture justifiable. And then if you look down at the United how States, do you find uh, how do you find uh, on right. the right? Right on the left. Yeah, it's um, it's an ideological scale where you place yourself essentially on the right or the left. It's on what basis? Economically or really? no? Politically, like, do you think of yourself as on the political right or political left? And so, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So self-identified, self-identified. The same thing in the United States. Do you think of yourself mostly as a liberal, moderate, or conservative? Um, so you know, looking at the U.S., um, self-identified conservatives, you know, much more likely than self-identified liberals to say that they find the use of torture in the post-9-11 era justifiable. You know, 44% point gap. So uh, like lots of things in American public opinion, big ideological differences. We also asked people about the potential use of torture by their own government against suspected terrorists. So if you look at the um, horizontal axis down here, that's uh, percentage of people saying that uh, they think that the use of torture by their own government against suspected terrorists would be justifiable. And the vertical axis is the percentage of people who think that the use of um, torture by the United States uh, was justifiable. And as you can see here, there's a pretty strong correlation between those two questions. So if you say that you don't think it was right for the United States to torture, you're also very likely to say that you don't think it would be right for your own country to torture. So in some ways, people's opinions are pretty consistent on this. Uh, and these two questions you know, are very highly correlated with one another. Um, so let's look at a couple of measures of American soft power. Uh, we asked a lot of different questions about American soft power. Um, this is data from a 20-country survey. These are median percentages across 20 countries. Um, we surveyed back in 2012. And it's, uh, it's pretty indicative of what we've found over the years. So, for example, uh, people very much admire the United States for its technology and its scientific achievements. It's something that's always a real strong suit of American soft power. They also tend to say they like American popular culture. You know, a lot of sort of intellectuals around the world don't always like American popular culture, but average citizens do. They, you know, they like their... Jay-Z or Taylor Swift or, or whatever, right? Um, American ideas about democracy get mixed reviews. This is something that we saw uh, this measure take a hit during the Bush era as uh, democracy promotion, I think, got associated with the Iraq War and elements of American foreign policy at that time that, that weren't very popular around the world. American ways of doing business, uh, again, mixed views about that. Um, although, interestingly, it tends to score pretty well in certain Arab nations where um, um, the U.S. is pretty unpopular, uh, but American way of doing business has some appeal. And then U.S. ideas and customs. Uh, a median of 68% across these countries said, we think it's a bad thing that American ideas and customs are spreading to our country. So, I always think that's an interesting contrast. You know, on the one hand, people like American popular culture, but on the other hand, they tell us that um, they, they don't really like the fact that American ideas and, and customs are spreading to their country. So on the one hand, they, they want to consume it, but they worry it's pushing out their own customs and traditions. And another element of American soft power uh, that we've asked about is, is whether the U.S. government respects personal freedoms. And we've asked this about other governments as well. So, 
again, this is meeting in percentages across 40 countries we surveyed in 2015, saying this about either the U.S. government or the Chinese government. So 63% across these countries said, yes, the U.S. government respects personal freedoms. Only 34% said this about the Chinese government. Uh, so this is, you know, something of a strong suit for America's image. It certainly fits into our notions about the United States and its respect for individual liberty. But what we've seen over the last few years is that um, this percentage has been going down in a number of countries, particularly among some of our strongest allies in Europe. So this is a uh, median percentage over time saying either, yes, I think the U.S. respects personal freedoms, or no, I don't think it does. Across five European countries, we've asked this question in, um, in many of the last several years. So 69% uh, in 2008 goes up in 2013 to 76%. But as you can see, it's dropped off a good bit in the years since. And I think part of that uh, is the torture report. Uh, it's the NSA scandal. Could be things like Ferguson and other uh, types of, of issues around police treatment of African Americans in the United States, which has gotten a lot of global publicity. Uh, you know, probably lots of things. But it's interesting that, you know, this question, um, on this question, just 53% say, uh, the U.S. respects personal freedoms now in these countries, compared to 69% during the last year of the Bush administration. So um, this is an element of American soft power that has uh, declined during the Obama years, uh, even though President Obama in many ways has been good <coughs> for American soft power. Um, so I'll leave it there, but just to, to conclude, I think um, how people feel about the United States is, is complicated, and there's a lot they admire, but there's also a lot about American power and reach that causes them concern. So, you know, in the cultural sphere, um, they, they worry about American culture pushing out their own culture. In the security sphere, they worry about things like drone strikes and eavesdropping. And on issues around torture and uh, detainees, when they see things like black sites and renditions, it reminds them of things about American power and reach that they don't like and often they cheat. Thank you.